All right, uh, we're going to go ahead and jump into the eleventh session out of fourteen. So we're nearing our our end here. Uh, we're getting into some time periods that we are much more familiar with. Some of you might even uh, have grandparents or great grandparents born in this time period. I know that I myself have. So we're going to be approaching more and more of the modern era. And as we do that, like I've said before, we're going to run the temptation of uh, maybe uh, personalizing things a little too much. So I encourage you to um, keep an open mind for what we learn about history and um, also uh, maintain that humility that we talked about, the humility to be able to look at the past and know that it's a mixed bag, right? There's good and there's bad. And the bad is often depressing to us, especially when we look back on our forebears. Um, but if we're honest with ourselves, we too are a mixed bag, are we not? Uh, we are good and bad. We make mistakes and we do good things, make wise decisions and unwise decisions, and history is no different. Well, tonight, if you remember last session, we discussed the Second Great Awakening and the, the prelude to war. Um, what we know as the American Civil War, and that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. And as this century wraps up and we go into the beginning, the end of the 19th century, um, we're going to look at uh, what is on the horizon for the church in America. So uh, i got a few goals for you as, as usual, uh, just three tonight. First of all, we want to give you an overview of the role that religion played in the American Civil War. Now, this isn't a history class. Remember, remember this is a church history class. Uh, so I'm going to hit on things that were happening because they're, they're somewhat inseparable. But I'm not going to go into lavish detail about events of the time period. That would be just broadly history. Uh, I trust that you can do your own research. We'll have to talk about a few of those things. But I'm going to specifically try and highlight the role that Christianity played in these world events, specifically these American national events. So we're going to look at the role that religion plays in this thing we know as the American Civil War. And then secondly, we're going to discuss the divided Protestant response to the war and the power of what we're going to talk about tonight, this term civil religion. Um, you might have heard it termed civic religion, same term. Um, and we'll define that more later on, what that is and what it means. And then number three, lastly, we're going to survey the post-war decades and the religious life leading up to what me and you know as World War I. So let's start with a map, as we always tend to do. Um, we are approaching what many have called the saddest um, moment in our nation's history, uh, our, our Civil War. And this is a map. Uh, of the landscape of that war. Uh, as you know, the southern states, the ones that you see in red, uh, were slave-holding states that decided to secede. The blue states are union states, and the ones you see um, with a red line through the blue were slave-holding union states called border states. And the gray that you see is just territories that hadn't yet become states. And if you remember, uh, the South breaks away, forms the Confederacy of the United States, and the Union, uh, of course, is the, the Union of the United States. And that leads us to uh, this conflict that we know as the American Civil War, a uh, very dark time in our history. Uh, as most of you know, just a brief survey, it was a war over the potential spread of slavery into new added Western states and territories. They were arguing the South was allowed to have slaves, the North had decided not to, and they were arguing to uh, these new states that were being joined to the Union. Uh, they wanted, some of them wanted to have slaves, some of them didn't. They were fighting about that because if more states had slaves than not, then in Congress they could pass a law, you know, legalizing it in the whole country, or vice versa. Um, so they were fighting over that. It really was ignited by the election of President uh, Abraham Lincoln. He was the anti-slavery candidate for the presidency. And he won that uh, uh, election, the Republican primary, and uh, became that president. And uh, the Southern Democrat, Democrats, of course, decided to secede and form a separate nation. Um, it was one of those most widely studied and documented events in all American history. 
Um, if you think about it, we have that advantage because it was right here on our soil, you know, in our backyards, especially us in the South. It did result, as you know, in the defeat of the Confederacy and the emancipation of all slaves in U.S. territory. Um, at the beginning of the war, uh, that was not so, but about halfway through the war, remember, he, he did the Emancipation uh, Proclamation at his speech at Gettysburg and freed uh, all the slaves in the South and the remaining slaves in the North. Um, it was this, you might not know this, uh, but it's very true. It was the deadliest military conflict in American history. And you heard me right, period, to, to this day. 750,000 soldiers. Um, I think in World War II, there was 420,000, to give you perspective. So nearly double World War II's casualties. So it, cl it claimed an immense amount of lives, almost an unfathomable amount as a nation, because the nation was nowhere as big as our nation is now, or as big as it was in World War I or II. Um, so many people lost loved ones. It was a brutal war, and this isn't including the civilian casualties. Um, from what I've been reading, they've had a hard time even calculating civilian casualties. So it's very possible close to a million people died in the uh, American Civil War. So it was a very bloody um, moment in our history. But again, I don't want to get lost in the details of the war as much as I do. What If, if, if you're tracking with the history so far, the church, the the nation is a predominantly Christian nation. I mean, most, most people affiliate with a church on some level. It's mostly Protestant, now a bunch of different branches, right? But mostly Protestant, some Catholics, a rising population of Catholics, and a little minority of Jews. But for the most part, a very religious nation. And then this terrible war breaks out. So we want to discuss what the role religion played in this war. Now, I want to say up front... Uh, this war was for sure, like all wars, a political and socioeconomic war. Um, there were wars that were deemed religious wars in the past, but it's very hard to get somebody just to go fight for something they can't see, if you follow me. Uh, you say, well, what about jihad and what about uh, crusades? Well, if you really go back and do the research... Um, Jihad and crusade was the fastest way to get richer in, in the day and time. Um, so uh, the, it, it always has an economic element and a political element. It's just how it is. Um, so it was the same with this war. This war is primarily a political war. So I don't want you to think that it was driven by religion. It wasn't. It was driven by these other issues like slavery, uh, states issues, uh, federal government issues, stuff like that. But it did have a large religious undercurrent that we're going to discuss tonight. Um, and this might be new to some of you. It was new to me, honestly, in a lot of my study. I'd heard, I, I figured I'd heard a few things similar to this. But I tried to really dive into this because I want us to think about how Protestantism especially played into the role of the Civil War. So first of all, uh, mainstream Protestants, if you remember last time we talked... Um, in the Second Great Awakening, he became very socially active. You all remember talking about that, starting things like abolition movements and uh, women's suffrage movements and um, clean up the inner cities movements and the, um, the, the teetotaler movement, the uh, prohibition movement, all these just social causes. Um, well, mainstream Protestants will continue to cast America's story in a Christian light. All right? So these metaphors and analogies that they're going to use, it's going to give further rise to an American civil religion. So what's going to happen is you're going to see both sides, but especially the North um, and then later on the South, using Christian terminology and Christian metaphors and Christian motifs to kind of whitewash the war. Or to, or to cast whatever's going on in the culture at the time in Christianese terminology. Does that make sense? So we're not just fighting a war, we're fighting a holy war. Uh, we're not, our leader isn't just a better leader, he's the leader chosen and by God. 
So you, know, you realize that takes things to a next level. You know, there's one thing to say that you like Abe Lincoln and you voted for him, but it's different to say that he's God's anointed, okay? That's taking Abe Lincoln from a man who's a president to now somehow God's holy instrument, you know, and vice versa for the South as well. And what it really does is it creates this term that we're going to talk about, civil religion. Now, y'all might be familiar with the term. It was coined in the Enlightenment. It's just a term to reference that whatever religion holds together a society. It can be an independent world religion or it can kind of be a religion of a culture. Um, I'm going to give you examples in just a, a minute. But what I mean at this point in time, the civil religion that America develops in this season of history is a Christian civil religion. Now, please get what I mean. It's not actually Christian. Does that make sense? It's cat because God didn't come down and choose Abe Lincoln, you know, and light it and writing bol lightning bolts in the sky. He didn't choose Je Jefferson Davis, you know. Uh, God doesn't work that way. God works through his church, and he's working globally, not just in America, you know. Um, but it casts these ideas in Christian terminology. So that's what I mean when it's a Christian civil religion. It's Christianese civil religion. So I want to give you a definition. This comes from the historian Mark Knoll, just to kind of help you. It should be in your paper, but this is the definition for what a civil religion in this era is. It's the, and you got to get this, if you don't miss anything tonight, don't miss this. It's the mingling uh, ultimate allegiance to the universal standards of Christianity with the particular values of a person's nation, region, or way of life. All right, so Christianity is a global religion. Y'all do get that right. Now, it might have been y'all's like grandparents or mothers or fathers or aunts, uncles religion. But it, as a Christian, it's not really your religion. Does that make sense? It's Christ's religion. It's a belief system founded on Jesus and his teachings and his word. So it exists independently of you. Like, really, what you think about it. Like, if you identify as a Christian, that's great. You're saying, what Jesus taught, what his word teaches, that's me. But when you step outside of that, you're operating outside of the umbrella of Christian. Does that make sense? But what a lot of people around the world, not just Westerners, but especially Westerners, what we've struggled to do is to borrow from the Christian religion and and. and and paint things that we personally believe or our nation believes or our people group believes in Christian terms. And you say, well, why would we do that? Well, I think it's an easy mistake to make. It's not hard. It's a subtle mistake you can make. But if you think about it, it puts the weight of God behind your ideas and your opinions. Um, no, now, no longer is the Union Army marching just to deal with the Confederates and free them. They're, they're singing the battle hymn of the Republic, and they're marching as the, the men of Israel and Gideon to go do the Lord's work as they slaughter, you know, thousands of people. Uh, same with the South. South uh, the Southerners are singing hymns as they charge into battle. And praying beforehand and having services because they think, you know, their priest or their, you know, their pastor will bless them or pray with them. And they think God is on their side. And see, this is a danger. But, and do we not face this in our day and time as well? It's very easy to do this. To, uh, I'm going to read it again. Civil religion, especially in this era, is mingling your ultimate allegiance to the universal standards of Christianity with the particular values of a person's nation, religion, or way of life. Very easy to do. Uh, so don't... It was hard for me not to be kind of um, arrogant and, and look down on our ancestors. But if you're really honest with yourself, is it not easy to fall into that same way of life? I mean, if you're a Christian person, you start thinking in Christian paradigms, and it's easy to assign... You know, things going on in the world, things going on in your nation in biblical terms. Um, but we have to maintain diligence uh, and not do that because it's a very dangerous ditch to fall into as we're going to see. Number two, during the war, Christians on each side 
are going to weaponize the Scriptures against one another. And they're going to integrate the stories of Scripture with their own national struggle. All right? We're going to show you some examples of that in a, in a minute. And this sets a dangerous precedent that will have lasting consequences. Some of you were alive when the ripples of this type of religious terminology still exist today. Because we use it now. I mean, presidents use religious terminology all the time, both left and right. Um, were any of you alive to hear the speech, The City on a Hill? Uh, who was that? Gave that speech? That was JFK, right? Or was it Ronald Reagan? Was it? I don't know. Reagan? Okay. And look, I'm not busting on Ronald Reagan, but the City on the Hill analogy is a perfect example because who's called the City on the Hill in the Sermon on the Mount? Nope. The church. The church is the city on the hill, not America, you know, not Britain, not Pakistan or whatever. The church is the city on the hill. So he borrowed that religious Christian terminology and cast America in that light, you know. And he was just trying to create a catchy speech, but it's easy to do, you know. We can do that all the time. So uh, let's look at some examples just to get you, get you digesting this better, some examples of civil religion. Now, I'm going to give you some pagan examples so you don't just think it's Christian. Uh, civil religion is any type of mystic religious system that holds a society together. So the first example, let's look at some historic non-Christian examples. Uh, ancient Rome. So in ancient Rome, the way they held the empire together was they had this personality cult around the Caesars, right? Caesar was God, right? He was equivalent with God. And Rome, when you spread the might and power of Rome, what are you spreading? Civilization is the way they equated it. You know, Rome is civilization. Rome is order. Rome is law. Rome is a mail system and roads and taxes. That's Rome. And war, in that lens, is honorable, right? Because it gains you access to the afterlife. So if you're the emperor and you need legions to go die for you, you can't just pay them because you can't pay people enough to just die. You know, I mean, I guess you can... Try, some people will, but most people aren't going to do that. You have to create a civil religion that supports the spread of the empire, right? That, that cast, cast it in religious tones so that people are motivated. Hey, if I go fight for, my, my, for Rome, you know, I'm going to die and I'm going to go, you know, up there with someone. And I'm going to be honored in the afterlife. Uh, the Soviet Union is a great example of a secular, modern-day civil religion. You know, they couldn't hold the Soviet... M most of the Soviet Union was Christian after it fell, after the, the czar government fell. And so they had... The Communist Party of the day really had to develop a, a strata, a, 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 something that bound the civilization together because it was no longer love of Mother Russia and the czar and Christianity... They had swept that away. Well, they needed something to replace it. So you have this rise of a civil secular religion where Lenin and Marx and Stalin are kind of treated like deities. If you've ever looked at any Soviet art, you know, Lenin was everywhere. I mean, his statue was everywhere. He was in every room. That there had to be a picture on the wall of, 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 of uh, Lenin. So he was kind of deified, and Marx was like the prophet, you know, and Stalin eventually deifies himself. And then after he dies, he becomes even more deified. Um, and then Marxism, the system, is, is kind of treated like the religion. So out with the categories of Christianity, in with like the Marxist categories. That's kind of the religion substructure. And then they had to have a bad guy, right? So the capitalists and especially the czar or the bourgeois, the bourgeoisie, however you say that, um, they're kind of cast as evil. They're the bad guys. They're the, the wet destroy Russia, you know. And if you have that in place, then you can get men to fight for you. You can get, you know, people to serve you. You can get armies to go do your bidding, you know, and that's kind of what holds society together. So this is some non-Christian examples of a civil religion. Here's some Christian ones from history. Uh, we talked about this guy, the holy, uh, this empire, the Holy Roman Empire. It was really the German. It wasn't really holy or Roman. Y'all remember that? It's the German Empire. Uh, Otto the Great was kind of cast in this role as God's appointed servant. 
to keep Christendom together. So, I mean, that's pretty good when you're God's servant because you get a free pass on things, right? Because you're God's, you're God's anointed one. And the empire is Christendom's only hope. The Germans had to come in because Rome had fallen. And to save us from the hordes of the east, the, the German empire had to come in and establish order. So it's, it's Christendom's only hope. And conquest was equated with evangelization. Now, there was some medieval evangelization, as you know, especially in like the British Isles and places, but the German Empire at this time, the Holy Roman Empire, mainly equates it with, well, you know how we're going to evangelize? We'll go in and conquer a little, we'll, we'll conquer them, and then they'll all be Christians. We'll make them, you know? Uh, and the king converts, and then the whole country converts. Um, a more modern example, the British Empire at times. Uh, the monarch was kind of seen as, you know, the head of the church, God's anointed, God save the queen, God save the king. Um, English law and commerce were kind of seen as the gospel, the good news. We'll bring English common law and commerce and all the great things that the British Empire has to offer. We'll bring it to the world, uh, to all the barbaric peoples across the planet. And they did the same thing that the Holy Roman Empire did. They equated conquest at times with evangelization. Now, Good note for the British Empire, there's parts of it that were nothing like that at all, but then you have like India, which was basically nothing. It's when the secular interest and Christian interests interest intersect, because India had a lot of goods, money, uh, uh, spices, uh, uh, iron ore, you know, farmland. So they're like, hey, India looks really nice. You Christians want to go with us? And, and they're like, well, we'll evangelize the heathen with you, you know. So when they intersect, then you kind of have this conquest and evangelization are the same thing. Um, but anyway, that's a good example. I hope this colors in what a civil religion is. Um, are any of these Christianity? Historically, did Jesus teach any of this? Did the apostles write anything about this stuff? The New Testament doesn't talk about any of this stuff. Usually it's the opposite. But somehow these civilizations have managed to take terminology like a God and a structure and an order to the universe and cast it in a civil lens, paint it the way they want. So to give you some illustrations of how they did that in this era, uh, we'll look at the Union and the Confederacy. Um, the, Christ, the Christianized civil religion of this era, let's look first at the Union. Um, you're going to see Abe Lincoln is cast in the role of like a biblical deliverer. And if you think about it, it's kind of providentially Christian. has the name Abraham, right? Like a father of a people. And so people see him as like a, they'll, they'll talk about him as God's chosen, anointed for this hour, picked out of against all odds, the father of a people. Now, um, if you don't think that that's true, has anybody been to D.C.? What did we do when he died? We built him a... No, we call it a monument. What's, in, what's engraved behind him? In this what? In this temple. The memory of Abraham Lincoln is enshrined forever for those that he protected to preserve the Union for, something like that. We literally built the dude a temple. Now, you might say, well, we don't actually worship him. Well, so, I mean, they, they didn't actually worship the Roman, you know, de, the Roman Caesars, but they did build them temples. <laughs> you know? It was a way of showing honor. And look, not that Abe Lincoln didn't do some amazing things. I mean, surely he did. But I don't think he would like a temple built to him if he was alive. They did that after his death. But we literally built a temple and made a Greco-Roman statue of him on a throne, <laughs> standing, you know. And we, millions of people visited every year, you know. So if you don't think this is true, he's very much cast in the role of the Moses figure, the great prophet deliverer, right? Uh, the union, I mean, uh, abolition, the cause of opposing slavery is going to be equated with the epitome of Christian virtue. So... Uh, and by the way, I, I do believe the New Testament clearly lays the groundwork for the abolition of slavery, especially chattel slavery. But if you think about it, this, this removed all nuance from the conversation. So if anybody had any hesitation about how to go about doing anything, the Protestants, didn't, the Protestants in the North didn't really care to have a discussion. They're just like, I don't care if we've got to go kill them all, let's go kill them all, let's just end this. 
It was a little haphazard, if that makes sense. And the way they got away with the haphazardness, uh, the willingness to just go to war and everybody go fight, no matter the cost, is because it was cast in religious terminology. It was seen as a holy war, right, to end slavery. Now, is a war to end slavery necessarily a bad thing? No. But casting it as a holy war, that's just taking it from a moral thing to a little too far, if that makes sense. Um, the war is seen as this holy crusade, as I mentioned. And then America, you're going to actually see the terminology, which you might have heard some today, as the new Israel. Uh, America is the new Israel, and Judah and Israel are fighting. And Israel's got to go down and bring Judah back into the fold. Uh, you'll see preachers speaking this way in the north. Uh, you'll see poets writing this way. Uh, the, the main leaders of the abolitionist movement at the time, anybody heard of Harriet Beecher Stowe? She wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. She is the daughter of Lyman Beecher, who is the famous evangelist from the Second Great Awakening. So these are the second generation of some of the most influential Second Great Awakening preachers and evangelists. So they had that same fervor in their bones to do whatever they can to change the culture at all cost. So you're going to see this religious use of terminology, this haphazard. And then in the Confederacy, it took a little longer because, honestly, the Confederates even themselves knew that they didn't have much of a case biblically for their side. But there was an argument that went, went on for quite some time in the South. Uh, Abe Lincoln is seen as Satan. You know, He's the Antichrist. He's, he's called that. Um, he's destroying the Union and the world. You know, he's, he's, he's casting this satanic image. And by the way, if you ever cast your political opponents or your enemies at work, or the people that you don't like, if you, if you have to jump to biblical categories, that's a very immature, unhealthy move. Um, nobody, Satan is Satan. Okay? Your, your, your boss isn't Satan. He might act like that occasionally, but he's not Satan. Uh, your political rival is not Satan. Um, it, it, it's, it's very easy to do, but the sound Slavery is biblically justified. So they tried to use the... The, uh, the arguments were, you know, like in Philemon and other places where Paul talks about slaves submitting and witnessing to their masters so that they might get saved. Well, the problem with this, obviously, is there was a major misunderstanding because of the, the underdeveloped sciences of things like archaeology. That Roman slavery, which could be freely entered into and freely exited, like if you had a debt... I would be your slave. You, you'll say, I'll pay you $250,000 for three years, and you can get out of debt. I'm your slave for three years, and then I'm done. I paid my debt off. I'm a free person. Um, that's very different than chattel slavery. Uh, uh, the slavery in the ancient world was not based on race. So it wasn't like in Rome, every, all the white people were, one, were Roman, and all the other colors were slaves. That's not how it worked. Um, Paul was Jewish, and he was also a Roman citizen. So chattel slavery is very different from the biblical form of slavery that they argued against. That's a little side note. Um, chattel slavery, which is race-based, is, is one of the most important things, and uh, going and kidnapping, you know, whole populace and enslaving them. But they try and use, see, instead of doing honest hermeneutics, they try and use sections of Scripture to justify slavery. So they're saying things like, well, how better to evangelize them to keep them safe under our house where we can take them to church and preach the gospel to them? It's like, well, yeah, I mean, you might be one out of a hundred slave owners that actually does that. I mean, most, I mean, most common folk didn't own slaves. It was usually these big industrial farms that we know as plantations like Grimesland, which was the closest plant plantation to here. Still there, by the way, the plantation house. Family still lives there and everything. Um, they we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of slaves. So you Sunday morning they're gathering all them together, you know, cleaning them up, taking them to church. I mean, come on, it, it was just a biblical justification for trying to keep the economically viable thing of slavery alive. The war is cast in this term of like a holy war of defense, like these evil Philistines are coming down into our land to destroy our home. You know, many Southerners didn't believe in slavery, but they fought because you were invading their homeland. Like, 
well, if you're going to burn down my home and kill my family, like, I'm going to fight you. You know, I might, I might even agree with you, but I'm, going to, I'm not going to let you burn my home and kill everyone. They, instead of just saying that, they went, had to go a little further to like, you know, the unions overstepped its bounds. Their, their, um, their sermons of, you know, casting them in a Nebuchadnezzar light and the, the Babylonians are coming down into, into Israel and, you know, we got to resist them. Um, it's seen that way. And then lastly, the Confederacy is seen as Israel under siege, right? So it's very easy to do, but sadly this happens in this time period because America is a very religious nation. So the knee-jerk reaction is to use Christian terms to kind of explain all of this stuff. Um, now, I know I said I wanted this to mainly be religious, and you're going to see this next picture, next picture and say, That's, he's not a religious figure. But it's worth mentioning, just a little time out for good old honest Abe, all right? Um, Abe Lincoln was not a religious leader per se in this time period, but he had a huge effect on the civil religion of our country. Because um, you'll see why in just a moment. But he's the 16th president of the United States, as you know. He was raised in poverty and greatly exposed, get this, to Second Great Awakening revivals and schisms. So when Abe was a young boy, the Second Great Awakening was raging. Well, they came through his town, one preacher after another, one rally, and he saw Presbyterians fighting with Baptists and Baptists fighting with Methodists, and he saw all the, all the schisms that could happen. And what did it do? It, it, it made him have a bad taste in his mouth for organized Christianity. Uh, he, he had little commitment to Orthodox Christianity. He was sus somewhat suspicious of churches and established dogma. So he was... People say Abe was a Christian. I would say he's more like Christian little c. Does that make sense? He was like Christianized more than a devout Christian. Because uh, many people asked him orthodox questions about Christianity, and he, either, he wouldn't comment or he would deny them altogether. So he really, later on after his presidency, as many of you will know him, he becomes this mythic figure in the Civil War, uh, in, in the American civil religion. Uh, due to his role in preserving the Union and being cast in that savior role. Uh, it's interesting uh, to note how much that actually plays out, because uh, you'll see in just a minute why. But um, in his speeches, if any of you have read his speeches, did anybody have to memorize the Gettysburg Address? Uh, uh, Blake, okay, say it for us, Blake. <laughs> Four score, how's it go? Four, yes, you all know the first part of it. It's American heritage, right? Uh, and it is an amazing speech. But if you read that speech, tons of religion. It's packed full of Christian imagery. Uh, so he, he employs these biblical images and these archetypes in his speeches and writings. And he, by doing that, he further merges Christian ideas with American principles. Now, before him, you don't see that as much. But since him, can anyone name a president that hasn't used religious archetypal language in any of their speeches in recent memory? They all pray. They all mention God. They all, in their acceptance speeches, talk about God and their faith. We're talking Democrat, Republican, Independent, all of them. It's almost like kind of expected that the president of America has a civil religious tone about him or her, right? Uh, it doesn't have to be Christian. It doesn't have to be like Baptist. It doesn't have to be Catholic. But it needs to be religious. It needs to have a Christian tone about it. Um, that really gets rolling with Abe. Um, that's not something that's always been around. And then to top it all off, this Savior metaphor, anybody know what day it was that he was assassinated? Good Friday. So the Savior of the nation is martyred, as people say, on the same day that our Lord was killed. So people kind of see that as providential for him being that Savior figure that was killed on Good Friday. Um, I don't want you to take my opinion for this. I'll give you a few quotes just to, so you can know. Like He spoke about America as the last best hope of earth, of the earth. You know, bold statement there. You know, it's like, I think the rest of the earth might go, well, you know. So, 
Okay. Um, I, he obviously really believed in his country. He liked his country, and he was trying to rally, you know, supporters. I get that. He's a politician. But it's a little bit of a bold statement to say that America is the last and best hope on the earth. <laughs> uh, he calls American the almost chosen people. Americans. So he won't say chosen people. He says the alma, it's almost as if God has chosen us to do this. So the almost chosen people. And these statements, along with many others, begin this trend of presidents using Christian motifs to illustrate the nation's identity and its position in time all the way to today. So um, that brings us pretty much to the end of the Civil War era. Um, let's look at post-war reconstruction and kind of what falls out after the war. Now, I got some pictures up here. Um, the, it's really hard for us to do, um, to, to give the Civil War its due on the level of pain and suffering it caused. Um, anybody, the Arlington Cemetery, if you've ever visited, you know, the Civil War section, it's bigger than the World War section. I don't get that. People usually go to see the World War section, but you ought to go look at the Civil War section. I mean, it's miles upon miles upon miles upon miles of tombstones, okay? So we're talking, whole, a whole generation basically gave their life in this terrible conflict, and the, the, the population that suffers the most is the South. Uh, the South is basically destroyed. Um, there's no railway system. There's no infrastructure. The ports are obliterated. Um, farms are burned. Houses are level. Sherman's march to the sea, one of the most brutal and uncalled for um, uses of force by the Union. After taking Atlanta, he marches to the sea and gives his army the order of a three-mile radius to burn and level everything in its path from Atlanta to the ocean, just as a, as a sign of force. Um, so it's really a sad time. Um, it looks almost like a world war. If you go and look at pictures, I mean, look at the destruction, because they really did, they were beginning to develop what we know as modern weapons at this point in time. So the Union has these mass-produced rifles, repeating rifles, and they have these uh, more advanced artilleries, at batteries, and they're just doing so much damage to, to cities, and it's really a sad time. So we're going to look at what happens in this area, this dark cloud, once the war finally ends. What does it really do to religion in our country? Well, first of all, sadly, um, all major denominations have a regional split. All of them. Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, all of them. Um, they all take sides. We're talking about the same denominations. So it's not like Methodist versus Baptist. We're talking about the Methodist church splits in half. There's a southern and a northern. The Baptist church splits in half. There is a southern and a northern. Same for the Presbyterians. Many of the, these denominations don't even rejoin until the 30s and 40s. Okay. Um, it's just crazy the fallout and the effect this has on religion because what does that do to our testimony publicly? Like we can't get over our nation's current struggle, so we're going to split over this issue. It's just, it's just how it happened. Um, and what you're going to find interesting is this war actually spurred the nation towards mass industrialization, Urbanization, everybody starts moving into cities, and the erosion of historic small town Protestant values. So the Protestants are like, go to war, you know, let's fight each other, let's fix this situation, especially the North, you know, for war, war, war. And what does it do? It actually has the reverse effect. It creates a nation that's more industrialized, that is less rural and more urban. And less family-centered, less small-town Protestant values-centered. So they shoot themselves in their own foot by pushing and supporting the political establishment. Go to war, go to war, go to war. They actually lay the groundwork for a lot of their own problems. Uh, Mark Knoll says this, great statement. The curious result was that a war won and lost by people who felt true religion was at stake... That war produced a nation in which the power of religion declined. 
So they thought that we ha- as Christians have to support what the government wants to do because it's just so important. we got to do it. And they actually sacrificed a lot of their influence as Christians because they took sides. And they got involved in the cl- conflict. If you ever have a, a, a famous history statement tattooed on your body, it's this next one I'm going to show you. And I'm being ridiculous, obviously. But... Um, I love this statement. It's from William Ralph Inge. If you marry the spirit of the age, you will be a widow in the next. He was speaking to Christians. If, if, if the church falls into the trap of marrying the spirit of the age, you'll be the widow of the next. See, the Christian church is called to transcend culture. We have to love the tensions of a culture. That's what makes Christianity so strong, is that it exists in hundreds and hundreds of cultures on every continent on earth. That's what makes it a powerful force. Not that it's American or British or African or Asian. It's that it's Christian. It transcends those categories. And when the Christians in a particular nation, as they have... All through time, not just our country, when they marry themselves to the political or social causes of their day, it always backfires. It actually lays the groundwork for the culture abandoning you in the next generation. Um, A perfect example of this, what culture capitulated to the social and political pressures of their day in recent memory to terrible effect? The Nazi Christians. You do realize in Germany, Germany was a predominantly Protestant Christian nation. We're talking gospel preaching, Bible believing, Lutherans, uh, and, and some Catholics, you know. I mean, we're talking about a very Protestant populace. And what happened? Many of them, most of them were not Nazis. You do know that, right? They didn't actually want everything that Hitler and the people promised. But they were in a position where they were scared. The West had robbed them of so many things. And the pressure of the day was, sign up for this Hitler guy. He's going to bring jobs back. He's going to fix the culture. He's going to run the Westerners off. He's going to defend Germany. We need to sign up for him. And look, yeah, he's a little rough around the edges. He's got some thugs with him, but who cares? We need to just sign up for this. And the pressure, you can't imagine. Y'all think our culture is divided and pressured? You don't even know. Uh, could you imagine Nazi rallies going through your neighborhood, and you mean to tell me it, you're scared out of your mind they're going to beat you over the head with a club, you're not going to wave a flag? I mean, it's easier to wave the flag than it is to die. And that pressure, what happened predominantly in Germany, the Christian church caved. And a small remnant went underground, but most of the Christian church in Germany caved to the Nazi regime. And what has happened since then? The second generation is almost entirely secular in Germany. Because they look back on it and they say, look, this didn't mean anything. I mean, you claim to believe in God and His Word and all that stuff, but you won't stand up for for this atrocity? atrocity? They didn't buy it. And that's the World War II has largely led to to the secularization of Europe because the Protestants and the Catholics dropped the ball. It was the same kind of in this time period. It really sets the nation up for the next generation being less religious because if you go to, if y'all were in the Civil War and you're sitting in a camp, did you know they had, they had evangelists, traveling evangelists, come around to all the camps? I read an account of there was one camp, a Union camp and a Confederate camp, and there was a ridge, and you could hear the hymns from each other's camps being sung. So they're both having a revival meeting. And what are they going to do in the morning? Get their guns and slaughter each other. And look, you do that, you pretend you're a soldier, you're sitting there and you're hearing this revival dude talk about Jesus and being a Christian, and then you go out the next day and everybody gets slaughtered. You know, it it erodes your ability to trust that, right? Rightfully so. So this is what the church must not do. We must not marry the spirit of the age. A few more results. Um... Northern uh, Protestants, they really view the emancipation, sadly, as the triumph. We won. We won the war. 
and, and they really kind of end the abolitionist movement. And they're going to overlook, basically, the topic of race relations in favor of other issues. Um, once they won emancipation, they're like, oh, we freed the slaves. Let's move on. And they went on to things like women's suffrage and the, and the teetotaler movement. They're like, let's deal with alcohol. Let's deal with women's rights. Let's deal with this, that, and the other. And they just kind of skipped. They're like, oh, well, the black people are free now, so it's fine. Who cares? We'll move on. And instead of really thinking about the fact that blacks now are free, yes, but they become second-class citizens uh, basically for another century until y'all's, really our, our earshot generation with Martin Luther King. That was really the first time that the topic of right, civil rights for especially blacks in the South was taken back up. Um, and that's a long time, if you think about it. That's a big gap. Um, and that's really, you know, sad, but the Northerners, that's kind of that spirit of the Protestant um, social activity, is uh, do this, and once it's solved, move on, do this, because it's all about changing the world, making everything better, you know, it's not about Christianity as much as it is about affecting change. Um, the South, sadly, is left ravaged. Um, did you know there have been reports literally up, uh, like, the South didn't recover economically to after World War II. From the Civil War. I mean, just the infrastructure was gone. I mean, it was just destroyed, leveled. I mean, they fought in my backyard where I grew up. There's a battlefield beside. We used to get bullets all the time, cannonballs. Many of you grew up on battlefields. I grew up at Wise Fork, one of the biggest battles around here. Um, so they literally fought in our backyards all the time. And it's left ravage, uh, poverty engulfs much of southern whites and blacks, um, fall into poverty. Uh, many flee because of this to the cities in the north and elsewhere looking for work. You're going to see the city populations in the north explode. So Chicago's booming, New York is booming, Detroit is exploding, you know, Philadelphia, all these places. A lot of those people are all southern migrants that move north because you couldn't eat in the south. Um, you all old time Southerners, anybody have relatives that was a sharecropper? I, my, my granddaddy's mother was the daughter of a sharecropper. That was a hard way to live, One, the hardest. I mean, you own no land, you farm somebody else's land, he gave you a cut, you ate beans and rice, and that's how you made it. That was really the name of the game. Unless you owned a lot of land in the South, you were dirt poor. So most people migrated, and the whites that did stay were poor. It's just how it was. Uh, many, us, many of us come from that heritage. Um, migration and the opening of the West, as the West expands, it creates even more religious, economic, and cultural pluralism. Those of you that are from the West, I read a lot about the West this week. Um, the West never had a religious hegemony of any sort. It's always been pluralistic from day one. Uh, California had a huge Hispanic Catholic population before it was even a state. So instantly the Protestants had resistance. Uh, Native Americans had their own indigenous religions and Christian versions, a Christian uh, uh, Native American religion. So out, out in the West, it don't work like it does in the East. If you're Protestant and, and well-to-do and a landowner, you can, get, you can go up pretty high in the East. Well, when the West starts getting one, it's everybody for themselves. Look, we're all something different out here, you know? <laughs> He's, he's Catholic, he's Protestant, he's Episcopal, who cares, you know. Um, and really that, as the West grows in population, it shifts the country even more pluralistic and less historically Christian, just kind of more like pseudo-Christian, you know. Um, but what's interesting is there's a last-ditch effort. Have any of you ever heard the term the Third Great Awakening? Um, some people try and term this in this time period. It's not really a, good, a well, well-developed turn, in my opinion. I could be wrong. But um, there is a little resurgence after the war of revivals. It's kind of like they want the good old days back when the Second Great Awakening was raging. So you see a rebound of, of Protestant revivalism, and it makes sort of a comeback in those years, although its former cultural power was nowhere realized. It, probably the most famous person that you know of from this era is... D.L. Moody. Um, D.L. Moody, Dwight Lyman Moody, the most famous evangelist of the time period. He kind of brings back, you know, some pretty large revivals. I mean, in Brooklyn, he had an insane amount of people. 
at one of his rallies. He's definitely the most prominent evangelist of this era. Um, he's an interesting guy. He moved to Chicago in the 1850s, right before the war. He was a successful businessman, so he made a lot of good money, uh, worked hard, and then in the process was converted, became a devout Christian. And after that, he gives, kind of gives up his business practices. And in the 1870s and 80s, he uh, gained international fame as an evangelist. Um, he was known for his dynamic and straightforward preaching style. He wasn't flashy like the Second Great Awakening. You'd probably find him boring. Uh, he was very straightforward and reasoning, didn't do a lot of raising of his voice, not, not a lot of showmanship. He was more like a businessman there to talk to you about why you should place your faith in Christ. Um, so he had an appeal to people in that day. Y'all probably know him as uh, founding Moody Church uh, in Chicago and the Moody Bible Institute, Institute. John attended the Moody Bible Institute. We had another couple in our church that did as well. Um, Moody Publishers, anybody heard of that? A book, you look on the back, Moody Publishers, he founded that as well. They all continue to function to this day, so he has a lasting impact. Um, you probably also might not know him but he, for this, but his legacy, he kind of brought this to the Protestant table. Uh, he had an, in, in, a huge emphasis on the importance of what you'll hear as a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. How many times have you heard that phrase? Well, he really coined and pushed that phrase. Before then, it was like believe in Jesus, you know. Uh, but he, he coined the phrase, uh, uh, but do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? You know, he used that terminology. Um, his, he also was a huge uh, social reformer, started educational institutions and all that stuff. Anybody ever heard of the colorless book? The colorless book, you haven't? Okay, the colorless book is a book, it's like red, yellow, gold, green, you know, whatever, and you tell... Not colorless. It's full of color. Excuse me. The wordless book. Not colorless. It's black and white. <laughs> the words. Thank you. Thank you, honey. The, the wordless book. Uh, it's just a page of colors. It's like five pages. And it's like, uh, you know, sin is red. or No, no, no. Sin is black. And then, you know, Jesus is red because it's blood. And you tell the story to people that don't read. He invented that. He came up with that technique because a lot of people were illiter illiterate at the time. So he, you didn't need to read to have that book. Uh, you could show some, you know, kind of explain the gospel to somebody. So uh, D.L. Moody was a good man. Um, it's also worth mentioning, uh, I know we have a missions major in, in here, so um, it, would, it would be wrong for us to skip this note, although we can't spend a lot of time here. The, this is known in missiology, the history of missions, missions as the great century of missions. Um, the late 19th century, so after the war, you're going to see uh, this huge explosion of mission work, especially out of Britain um, and other European countries, but America hopped on the wagon too. Um, you'll see the rise of these societies, missionary societies, like the American um, Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, ABCFM, if y'all have ever heard of that, and the Women's Foreign Missionary uh, Societies. They played a pivotal role in sending missionaries abroad. Uh, some of these names you might recognize. You're going to have famous people like Adoniram Judson, missionary to Burma, um, uh, Mary Slessor, a missionary to Nigeria, Hudson Taylor to China. They gained, uh, gave, uh, gained huge renown uh, during this time period. What really set it apart in America more so than others is that women are going to be really involved in this movement. Um, it's, a, it's a largely uh, you know, women-centered movement. I mean, you have single women raising money and going across the pond to Nigeria alone, you know. Um, and some of them died, but uh, some of them carved out great works by the work of, uh, of grace. So it's an interesting time period. And uh, lastly, our last slide, we have to talk about this to lay the foundation for next week. Um, so if you, if you track the logic here, we've had a war. It kind of disenfranchises everybody with religion. Everybody's kind of loosely Christian, but they don't want to hear a lot of preachy, preachy stuff. You got a little bit of it going on in big cities through D.L. Moody and stuff like that. But towards the end of this century and the beginning of the century that most of us were born in, the 19th or the 20th century, uh, the 1900s, um, there's this huge key event right there at the end of the 19th century. And that is um, uh, Darwin's uh, origin of species. 
And um, there had been many theories about evolution and other things, natural processes for life before him, but he coined the most convincing one when he wrote that book. And it really hit the, the airwaves, although there weren't airwaves, but it hit the printing presses uh, at a time that, uh, that the, the cultures of the West were uniquely prepared for a skeptical look at Christianity. Uh, for what many of them perceived as failures on the part of Christianity, like the world wars. Um, so we'll get more into that next week, but you, you're going to see the rise of this term, biblical criticism. Please note that. You need to know that term to understand American Christianity. Biblical criticism. Um, with the advent of Darwinian evolution, it, what it does is it creates an atmosphere of criticism of Scripture, specifically in academia. Uh, so in post-enlightenment, uh, France, um, Germany, especially Germany, some in Britain, you have the intelligentsia, those that are in the higher echelons of, um, of academia, right, starting to be very critical of the scriptures. Uh, they're, they're starting to use, his, you're having the advent of what we know as archaeology. So <clears throat> some of the earliest findings of that are starting to criticize the way the scripture says some things is maybe that's not accurate. Maybe that's not historic. And you get this movement called biblical higher criticism. Um, so what they do is they develop these theories to harmonize scripture with the sensibilities of the era by eroding scripture and some of its claims. So in Germany, the, the reaction is the upper echelons of the seminaries say, oh, 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 you know, the scientists and the the, the paleontologists and the archaeologists are starting to call, call the Bible out on some mistakes it's made. So what we need to do is instead of sticking to the Bible and just waiting, like we have rediscovered many things in the modern era that do not contradict the Bible, and the Bible is not a scientific book. It, the Bible is a story, primarily. It's not written about how neutrons work. It's written about how salvation works, how redemption works. And as time went on, we've recovered. You know, obviously today, Christianity is larger today than it's ever been, right? Um, but instead of waiting for that to happen, you're going to see a lot of people, Christians in Germany especially, capitulating to the culture and developing this thing called biblical criticism, which is a method of trying to harmonize scientific discoveries with what the Bible seems to say. The problem is, for instance, like, they, they saw no evidence for um, a crossing of the Red Sea. Uh, they argued that the oldest text should be translated the, the Reed Sea, the Sea of Reeds. Whether it's reeds or red, that doesn't matter to the story at all. But they get called on that, and they argue about that issue, right? And, and what they wind up doing is they start capitulating things, and it actually winds up undermining Scripture, because um, they're more concerned about the culture respecting Christianity than they are Christianity sticking to what it believes. So you're going to see this eroding of Scripture, and this tension is going to lay the groundwork for future controversies after World War I. So we've got to take a huge time out called World War I. This stuff is kind of brewing, and then a world war breaks out. <laughs> so it stops all of that. There's no discussion about any of that stuff, we have to go fight a world conflict because everybody's going to die if we don't. So next week, we'll pick back up with the World War I and World War II, and it's a religion globally and especially in America. But what it does is it kind of puts a pause on this issue, biblical criticism, until the war is over. And then when the soldiers get back, they go back to arguing and uh, this issue lays the groundwork for what you might know as the modernist, fundamentalist controversy of the, of the 20s, 30s, and early 40s. Um, so if you're called a fundamentalist today, that term originated from that era. Um, and we'll look at the rise of what's called liberal theology. Um, that doesn't mean liberal as indifferent than what you think. It means there's a specific meaning. But that brings us to this famous century. Um, the 20th, which I was born at the end of. Uh, raise your hand if you were born in the 20th century. Okay, most everybody. Who was not? Lauren, I know you weren't. Anybody else? Only Lauren and Sutton? 
only two people in this room not born in the, the 20th century. So as you know, i got a bunch of people up here, a whole bunch of people. This is going to be the... Um, it's going to be the deadliest century in American, and I mean, in uh, human history. Um, we kill more human beings in the 20th century than all other centuries combined. Um, two global conflicts and many other conflicts. So it's it's a hard century, but we're also going to see crazy advances. I mean, if you start at 1900 to 1999, when I was seven. The, those that's a big jump in 1900 to 1990. I mean, a total change of everything. Um, so this is a huge century. You don't want to miss next session. It's a huge century for the church, because really there's tons of turmoil, lots of pain and suffering, but also a lot of change, and some of it really good, uh, some of it not so good, uh, most of it uh, pretty brutal. But for the church, there is some good things, and that's going to prep us for later times when we go into even our modern era. All right, so that is, uh, that is all we have for session 11, the Civil War and a new century.